We've got some fresh images of 3i Atlas, a third ever interstellar object observed from Earth, currently racing. The story begins not with a flash of light, but with a whisper. In late July, astronomers scanning the dark began to notice something faint, something moving faster than the rest. At first, it was dismissed as a fragment, a wanderer from the Kuiper Belt disturbed from its slumber. But within days, the truth became clear. This object was no local stone. It came from beyond, a visitor from interstellar space, the third such object ever recorded after the famous Oumuamua in 2017 and Borisov in 2019. They named it 3i slash ATLAS. From the beginning, its behavior defied expectations. It didn't arc lazily through the outer system the way most comets do. It slashed inward at nearly unimaginable speed, a blur against the star field. Its velocity measured at over 87 kilometers per second relative to the sun. At that pace, it could cross the distance from Earth to the moon in under an hour and a half. For a time, astronomers were content to treat it as another fleeting curiosity, a once-in-a-lifetime comet that would pass and be gone, leaving us only with fragments of data. But then something shifted. The James Webb Space Telescope, humanity's most sensitive instrument, was trained on 3i slash ATLAS to measure its composition, its surface, its secrets. The web does not lie. With its piercing infrared vision, it peeled back the comet's halo and looked directly into its chemistry. What it saw made scientists' blood run cold. Instead of a predictable arc, the path of 3i slash ATLAS appeared to be tightening. Instead of slowing slightly as sublimation forces balanced gravity, the object seemed to accelerate. Not randomly, not chaotically, but rhythmically. Every 17 minutes, Webb recorded faint jets of gas, expelling with precision. They weren't eruptions from melting ice. They were pulses, deliberate, patterned, consistent. It was as though 3i slash ATLAS was steering itself. The math shifted overnight. What was once a comfortable miss became a razor-thin margin. Initial projections suggested it would pass Mars at nearly 2 million kilometers. Then, after another round of pulses, the number dropped, 1.5 million then under a million. By late August, Webb's ultra-fine measurements confirmed the unthinkable. If the object continued adjusting its trajectory at the current rate, it would not miss at all. It would collide with Mars. Across observatories, disbelief turned to panic. At NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, simulations were run again and again. Each time the outcome sharpened, the impact corridor widened until there was no ambiguity. The red planet was in the crosshairs. The countdown had begun. But why? That was the question that tore through the scientific community. If 3i slash ATLAS were merely a natural interstellar comet, its behavior was impossible to explain. Jets don't fire in 17-minute intervals. Trajectories don't bend into perfect alignments with planetary orbits. And natural radar echoes don't return metallic signatures. When the Goldstone Antenna Array bounced radar off the object, the reflections that came back weren't soft and diffuse like ice or dust. They were sharp, hard, glinting like steel. Someone or something had built this. The press conference that followed was unlike any in modern history. Standing before the world, officials from NASA, ESA, and international partners admitted what no agency had ever dared to before. The James Webb Telescope had confirmed an interstellar object on a collision course with Mars, and its behavior strongly suggested intelligence. The room fell silent. The words hung like a storm cloud. Humanity, for the first time, was watching not just a rock fall from the sky, but a guided strike. The implications were staggering. An impactor of this scale, 10 billion tons of mass, moving at over 57 kilometers per second, would release more than 2 million megatons of energy. The Chicxulub asteroid that ended the reign of the dinosaurs was smaller, slower, and still scoured the Earth's surface, plunging the planet into centuries of darkness. On Mars, the effect would be catastrophic. A crater 60 kilometers wide would open in its crust. Shockwaves would circle the planet, raising dust storms that could last decades. Subsurface ice would flash melt. Entire canyons could collapse. Mars would be reshaped before our eyes. For planetary scientists, this was both nightmare and miracle. Mars, long believed to have once been home to oceans, rivers, and perhaps even life, still guards its secrets beneath its rust-red soil. An impact this violent could shatter those secrets wide open. Buried ice, hidden aquifers, ancient fossils, any of these could be blasted to the surface waiting for our instruments to analyze. 
If there was ever microbial life on Mars, this event might finally expose it. But the optimism was muted by fear. Because if 3i slash ATLAS could adjust its path to hit Mars, then it could just as easily have adjusted to hit Earth. That simple fact changed the tone from scientific curiosity to existential dread. Governments convened emergency councils. Could the object be intercepted? Could a mission be mounted in time? The distances and velocities involved made interception almost impossible. Even our fastest rockets would take months, if not years, to match its path. And Webb's own data suggested impact within a decade at most. Proposals emerged to use kinetic impactors, nuclear devices, even solar sails. But the sobering truth was clear. If this thing wanted to hit Mars, nothing could stop it. And that led to the darkest question of all. Was Mars chosen on purpose? It made sense in a grim way. Mars was humanity's next frontier. Dozens of missions, both robotic and planned crewed expeditions, were charted for the coming decades. Elon Musk's SpaceX was preparing Starship launches aimed squarely at Mars colonization. NASA was laying out roadmaps for habitats on the surface. The European Space Agency dreamed of joint projects. Mars was humanity's stepping stone into the wider galaxy. And now, something from the wider galaxy was aiming straight at it. Astronomers speculated endlessly. Perhaps it was coincidence, a cosmic accident magnified by paranoia. Perhaps 3i slash ATLAS was a derelict probe from an ancient civilization, long since abandoned, its course altered by chance. But the pulses, the precise targeting, the metallic radar echoes, they argued against chance. This was intent. By September, Webb's instruments revealed more. The pulses weren't random jets of gas. They were chemically unique. Instead of simple water vapor or carbon monoxide, Webb detected exotic compounds metallic nanoparticles, engineered carbon structures, and faint traces of isotopes not typically found in comets. The ejections were cleaner than any natural process could explain. They resembled exhaust. And then came the beams. Amateur astronomers in Chile, using long exposure photography, captured faint green streaks emanating from 3i slash ATLAS. Not tails, not dust, but needle-like lances of coherent light. They pulsed in harmony with the gas jets, three beams fanning outward, all converging toward Mars. It was undeniable. The object wasn't just flying by, it was pointing. Within weeks, the internet erupted, theories proliferated. Was this an alien weapon, a probe, a warning? Was Mars being chosen as a demonstration, a message to Earth? Or was it something else entirely, an attempt to terraform the planet by force, to awaken its surface with fire and shock, to prepare it for something new? Meanwhile, scientists struggled with the ethics. Should humanity try to stop the impact? Should we send missions to study it up close? Or should we do nothing and watch history unfold? Our telescopes recording the first interstellar collision ever witnessed. For many, it was irresistible. This would be the greatest natural experiment in planetary science, a chance to watch a world reborn through violence. But if it was not natural, if it was intentional, then our passivity might be seen as weakness. As the debate raged, time slipped away. The numbers became more precise. 3i slash ATLAS would intersect Mars's orbit on September 23rd, 2031, give or take 12 hours. The margin for error shrank daily. The impact was inevitable. On Earth, humanity prepared as if for a war it could not fight. Telescopes were aligned, satellites repositioned, rovers on Mars reprogrammed to record as much as possible before the end. The Perseverance rover, still trundling across Jezero Crater, was tasked with transmitting continuous video until its systems were destroyed. The Ingenuity drone, long retired, was refitted for one last desperate flight. Every lens we owned was pointed skyward. And then there was silence. The weeks before impact stretched like taut wire. Humanity waited, watched, wondered. Across the world, people looked at the red dot in the night sky and knew it was about to change forever. Mars, the ancient god of war, was about to be struck by something far older, far stranger. And then it happened, a flash brighter than any star lit the Martian hemisphere. For a moment, Mars became a second sun in the sky, a blistering wound of white fire. Telescopes overloaded, sensors screamed. Across Earth, people gasped as the red planet vanished beneath a halo of light. When the glare subsided, what remained was chaos. A plume, thousands of kilometers high, ejecta spreading like wings, dust blanketing the surface. Where once there was desert, now there was fury. 
The crater was immense, larger than entire countries. Shock waves tore across the thin Martian atmosphere, raising storms visible even from Earth. The planet's climate was rewritten in an instant. Dust veiled the sky, temperatures plummeted, and frozen reservoirs cracked open, spilling vapor into the air. Mars was bleeding, reshaping, reborn. And in the debris, sensors picked up something stranger still. Among the shattered rock and glass, metallic fragments glittered. Shards not native to Mars, not natural, not random. Pieces of three I slash A-T-L-A-S itself. Engineered alloys, structures, even hollow chambers. It had not been just a comet, it had been a vessel. What had it carried? Why had it chosen Mars? And was this the beginning of contact or the end? No one could answer. Humanity could only watch, awed and terrified, as Mars smoldered under the weight of its visitor. The James Webb Telescope, the first to see it coming, now stood as the prophet of a new era. We had looked into the void, and the void had looked back. The future of Mars, and perhaps of humanity itself, had been altered in a single blinding moment. And somewhere in the wreckage of that collision, the truth of 3i slash A-T-L-A-S awaited discovery. A truth we might not be ready to face, because if it really had been aimed, if it really had been sent, then one day, Mars may not be the only target, and the countdown may already have begun. The silence following James Webb's last transmission wasn't just absence. It was deliberate. For hours, data streams went dark, not from malfunction, but from lockout. Only fragments leaked through. A spectral curve here, a low-frequency pulse there. The astronomy community, scattered across forums, private servers, and encrypted back channels, stitched together what they could. The picture that emerged was incomplete, terrifying, and too coherent to dismiss. Three Atlas wasn't drifting anymore. It wasn't even accelerating in fits and starts. It had entered something resembling a holding pattern, an orbit, but one that defied simple Newtonian expectations. Its trajectory bent, flexed, corrected itself in ways that suggested anticipation. Not a stone falling toward a well, but a predator circling before striking. The Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter recorded micro-adjustments so precise they would put Earth's best propulsion systems to shame. Tiny jets of outgassing flared like whispers, bursts of force too faint to move a natural body, but enough, when repeated, to shepherd its mass into alignment. Every course correction pointed toward Elysium Planitia, the so-called Silent Basin. For decades, planetary geologists dismissed Elysium as curious but ordinary, a flat volcanic plain shaped by lava flows. Yet now, with three atlas poised above it, the features looked staged as if the land had been waiting for something to arrive. And then came the pulses. Not just light, not just gas, radio waves. For years, SETI had pointed its great dishes toward the stars, listening for whispers across the void. But the signal didn't come from Tau Ceti or Proxima. It came from Mars, from beneath the Elysium crust. A broadband burst, perfectly timed to coincide with Three Atlas's periapsis burn. The pulse wasn't static, it was structured. 17 second bursts, then silence, then 17 again. The same interval as Three Atlas's gas pulses. They were in conversation. In Houston, at Johnson Space Center, a classified briefing erupted into chaos. Astronomers shouted over engineers, biologists demanded proof, and military advisors spoke in clipped, panicked tones. The phrase, impact protocol, appeared again, stamped in red across the top of briefing packets. But now, a second phrase had joined it. Convergence event. What did it mean? No one could answer. Whistleblowers later described the room not as a scientific conference, but as a war council. Discussions shifted from analysis to response. Could Atlas be destroyed? Could Mars be shielded? Could humanity intervene in any meaningful way? The answers came swiftly, brutally. No. The object was too fast, too massive, too intentional. What unsettled the scientists most wasn't its size. It was its restraint. If three Atlas could accelerate at will, why hadn't it smashed into Mars already? Why the slow circling? Why the timing? The alignments? The cryptic pauses? It wasn't random, it was choreography. And choreography, by definition, has an audience. As panic swelled on Earth, telescopes captured something stranger still. The shadow trailing Atlas, that elusive dark twin no radar could pin down, began to shift. At first, it mirrored perfectly, as though tethered, but in late observations from the European Southern Observatory, it diverged. Not much, just a fraction of an arc second. But enough, it was no longer a mirror. It was a partner, its outline sharpened, not a smear of dust, not an amorphous field, but edges, a structure hidden in void. 
When filtered through Webb's infrared sensors, the silhouette resembled a lattice, hexagonal, crystalline, impossibly symmetrical. The shadow wasn't matter in the conventional sense. It was a framework, a scaffolding of absence that only revealed itself in negative space. Some called it a cloak, others a vessel. But one term began to spread through the encrypted chat rooms of astrophysicists, whispered half in jest and half in dread. The architect. If Atlas was the stone, the architect was the hand that threw it. Then came the first ground tremors on Mars. Seismographs aboard InSight, dormant for months due to power loss, flickered back to life with inexplicable surges. Data streamed in, revealing vibrations rising from the Martian core. They weren't random quakes. They were rhythmic, perfectly synchronized with Atlas's pulses. Imagine a heart resuscitated after centuries of silence. That's what it looked like. Mars wasn't quaking. It was waking. And in its awakening came sound. The low infrasonic hum picked up beneath Olympus Mons intensified, spreading across the entire planet. Each crater, each valley, each canyon became a resonator. Mars wasn't broadcasting a single tone. It was singing, an orchestra of planetary geometry vibrating in unison. The song wasn't for us. It was for Atlas. And Atlas answered, its tail brightened, venting not randomly, but in harmonics that matched Mars's frequencies. Object and planet were no longer separate. They were locked in duet. Humanity scrambled for meaning. In Peru, archaeologists compared the harmonic ratios to Incan quipu knots, finding eerie correlations in interval spacing. In Tibet, monks retrieved scrolls describing a red awakening heralded by a serpent of light. In the Middle East, scholars revisited Babylonian tablets, translating passages that spoke of the wanderer that bends the red god's ear. Everywhere, ancient records seemed to anticipate this moment, as though cultures long dead had glimpsed a future replaying itself. Coincidence? Or continuity? The question burned hotter than the Martian surface. And then, as the world braced for impact, something impossible happened. Atlas slowed. Its speed, once measured at 57 kilometers per second relative to Mars, decayed. Not because of drag, not because of gravitational braking, there was none sufficient but because it chose to. The object reduced velocity with deliberate precision, aligning with Mars's orbital velocity until, impossibly, it matched. Instead of striking, Atlas slid into orbit. Not a chaotic tumble, not a captured comet wobbling around Mars, a clean, stable orbit. The world held its breath. For the first time in recorded history, an interstellar object hadn't just passed through, hadn't just brushed a planet. It had parked itself around one. This was no longer speculation. It was undeniable. Three Atlas was not a rock. It was a vehicle. And its mission had just entered the next stage.